next subject to talk about in, in biodiversity, factors influencing biodiversity, is the relationship between the number of species and area. And this holds for many, many organisms that if you have some sort of insular habitat, island, if you want to call it that, and you look at the area of it, um, we have, this is the area of lakes versus in upper Midwest and the number of fish species. And this is the um, area, this is diatoms, and this is a series of glass slides that Ruth Patrick put out. And Ruth Patrick, remember, was one of the questions uh, that was on the quiz. Uh, she uh, worked in, in, in Pennsylvania, and when they found out the, this idea of island biogeography came out, she took glass slides and put them out in the stream, or apart from each other, and looked at the area of those, of, of those number of species. And then the one on the top, A, is, is uh, so size of stones and, and um, in, invertebrates. This, the one in A is actually related to a lab that we'll do um, where we look at the size of stones and invertebrates from uh, Pillsbury Crossing, um, Deep Creek. Although this year, because of the COVID, we'll, we won't, we'll be using data that, that were collected um, by other classes. What did the S equals CAZ mean? Um, that's a good question. Let me go back. I was going to pause with my question. So S is the number of species, and this is a constant. These A, C and Z are constants relating it. It's a logarithmic relationship, and A is the area of the of the um, island or the habitat that you're talking about. So it could be the size of a pond or a lake, or it could be, you know, uh, that, that's, a, that's a common one for freshwaters to think about. Good question. So I've got a lot of good um, answers here that why people think that there'd be more diversity with the size of an island. More habitats is certainly a good one as well. Um, in addition, the populations on islands are determined by the rates of, of immigration and extinction. So immigration, the rate that things come into an island is greater if it's a bigger one, just because the chance of something getting there is greater. And the chance of extinction is greater with a smaller island because either by chance a hurricane could wipe something out or you know a lake could drain or dry up if it's smaller um, and, and, and wipe out the population more easily than something that was larger. And then also um, we talked last time, uh, last lecture about inbreeding depression and that how small populations may not actually be able to minimum viable population size may be too small to, to, su to support. So all, all of those things are, are good reasons why you have lower diversity um, per, per unit area actually, per unit area in smaller islands. And that you know, goes from you know, whole continents. Um, so the continent of the United States has evolved more species per unit area than the island of Hawaii, for example. And so semi-related to this is the idea of invasions of non-native species. So if we think about islands, a lot of those are invasions, but that's happened naturally. Um, but, but humans, because we are moving materials around at, at really high rates uh, and organisms around either on purpose or by mistake, people dump aquaria. Um, there's, there's things that get stuck in boats that, that come across. Um, people bring in things different different ways um, in, and cause expansion of unwanted species into, into habitats. We already talked about zebra mussels uh, being invaders. We've also talked about a little bit about the fact that water, um, that um, water hyacinth can be one that clogs streams in tropical areas, hydrilla. There's this is a whole bunch of different uh, species that we're having troubles with. <clears throat> and there are some conceptual ideas about why species invade successfully. Um, most invaders fail to establish first. So um, in most things you release into the environment are not going to make it, they're not going to be able to compete successfully. Um, and that's you know, true with a lot of, of 
purposeful introductions of say fisheries where they repeatedly stop fishes because they they this these sports fish that people want to catch can't reproduce and establish in an area unfortunately there's the other side of that where they've introduced species um, as sports fishers and then they've been they've been uh, basically been invaded so an example would be carp from from um, Europe where a lot of people would eat carp and they were invaded and they were introduced into the United States and they can have really big effects on systems uh, graze them down cause turbidity and then we have a whole series of carps that have been brought in here brought into the United States for things like aquaculture that have, that have escaped as well um, most su successful invaders have no significant effects so that's sort of related to the idea that we had, that we talked about when we talked about species um, interactions, where most direct interactions are, you know, are sort of zero interactions or, or not very strong. And they may, have, they may eat some stuff, but they may or may not be really harmful. So there's things that, you know, seem to have come to equilibrium with the environment. We talked about water hyacinth being one that was introduced from Europe into the streams of North America. It doesn't seem to have really strong effects, although it's well established here. All aquatic systems can be invaded, um, so it, it, everything is, is prone to being invaded. The biggest effects occur in off, most often in low diversity systems. So if we have, for example, an island that has a fairly low diversity invertebrate and fish community, and we introduce an, another species of invertebrate or fish, that's where we can get the really catastrophic changes. In, Top predators are really important. You can imagine why, right? And I'm sure that you can guess what somebody just say why well, that that is. Why do top predators tend to have more strong effects? Is it because nothing balances them out? They just eat everybody. Yeah, basically, they just eat everybody. So that's a good one. Um, they have to be physiologically and morphological adaptations to invade successfully. So we talked about how water hyacinth is important in in subtropical areas, uh, but it just can't make it further north because it can't withstand freezing in the winter. Invaders are more likely to become established in disturbed systems, so there seems to be space for, for organisms to, to be there, uh, not get out-competed if the if, if a, if a, um, system's more disturbed. Environmental variability can play a role in establishing, sort of related to the disturbance ideas. However, stable systems can be vulnerable to invasion as well. So again, all aquatic systems can be invaded. That goes back to the, the original point. The greater the number of invaders and the number of invasions, the greater the probability of successful invasion. That makes perfect sense, right? We have the minimum viable population. Um, if it's a sexually reproducing species, obviously at least one of um, a male and female need, need to, to invade but also there needs to be enough diversity, to, um, genetic diversity to form a viable population. And if the chances are, you know, we talked above there, environmental variability can play a role in establishment. If an invader comes in at a time when it's difficult to grow, maybe it can't get a toehold, but if it comes in a time when it's, it can build up enough biomass and, and populations that it can. And maybe the last point that species have a history of prior invasions are likely to invade successfully again is, it's kind of a circular argument, but there are species that just seem to be really good, you know, really adaptable and really good invaders. So, um, you know, wild pigs, uh, trout are, are, have been introduced all over the place and have been very successful at inhabiting a lot of cold water habitats in, in the world. And they're, they're probably one of the most widely um, widely invasive species uh, in cool waters that's been mediated by human actions. And this is just one example of, of uh, a habitat that's been highly invaded um, in the Great Lakes because there's been so many people bringing stuff into that area in the, in the big. And we, we talked about the ballast water and the, the, um, and the zebra mussel, but also ballast is and historically is also they've used soil as ballast and so they've brought in plants um, and and there's quite a few other um, intentional um, invasions there as well.
Um, these include the sea lamprey, um, and one of the things that the Great Lakes were uh, separated from marine habitats. Why is that? What, what is the barrier historically that, that kept the, the marine habitat, things from marine habitats coming upstream and getting into the Great Lakes? Was it that there was no like channel letting anything in or out? There's large rivers leaving the Great Lakes that flows through the Great Lakes and out all the way to the ocean. Think romance and honeymoons, that's a hint. Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls, good, Tom, yeah. So there's a big waterfall. So sea lampreys couldn't get, um, they, they basically um, are parasites of salmon and salmonids, um, but sal salmon couldn't go, the Atlantic salmon couldn't get up those waterfalls and neither could the sea lamprey. However, as um, for transportation in the Atlantic, uh, historically, there were a lot of canals, such as the Erie Canal, um, which you may have heard the song about, but um, they pulled barges along those canals, and there was a whole network of those, and they used those to connect the Great Lakes to, to the ocean. And when they did so, um, the sea lamprey came in, and there was native lake trout there, and, and there, there was actually a commercial lake trout fishery that crashed because the populations came down so heavily from that um, sea lamprey coming in. Purple loose stripe is another one. Um, this is when, um, it, it, again, in the 1800s, when ships did were able to get in, in from Europe after the um, connections were made with the canals and locks and things to bring them up. The, uh, the plants were, were in solid ship ballast and they're a wetland plant that can be just completely take over. And there's a section in the book on, the, on purple loose stripe invasions. Um, shipping canals, also alewife is another species that can come in from, um, can come in from uh, marine systems. There is a bunch of, of carps, carp, salmon, uh, brown trout have all been, um, brown trout, uh, two, two types of salmons have been introduced. Um, and it can, it, they can be um, harmful in some ways, but a lot of people like them. Um, the white perch came in. We've got some, um, also uh, some macrophytes. There was um, intentional introduction of Washington DC with Eurasian water milfoil in the 50s and it competes with native plants. And more recently, we talked about the zebra mussel. There's some fishes and some gobies. And this is just a subset of them. There's, there's a, a bunch more. So you can see some of them are intentional and some of them are unintentional. It's only fairly recently that people have really started to understand that, that invasive species can be so harmful and that there have been regulations on things to stop the um, import of invasive species. So one of the things that they do for the Great Lakes is if you're coming from a freshwater port in Europe or elsewhere, um, and you have ballast water, you're required to pump all the freshwater ballast water out and when you're out in the open ocean and then put um, salt water, marine salt water in your ballast. So then if you release that ballast water when you get into port in the Great Lakes, you're not gonna be putting any organisms in there that can, you know, that would be likely to establish. And also you just flush everything out and put new water in. So, um, and, but there's this sort of ongoing thing where people will take their aquarium fishes and just dump them out. So, you know, for example, Southern Florida has a huge number of species that have just been thrown, thrown in there and then have, have to, got a toehold. This is another invasive species um, and it's called Didymosphera. I'm sorry, Dimosphenia, and it's a, a diatome, a stock diatome, and um, its common name is rock snot, and you can see off on the right um, a big glob of that stuff. This one's an interesting one because it's come into cold, cool water, low nutrient streams in many places around the world, and you can imagine that when it covers over the, the entire bottom of a stream like this, there are many species that can't make it um, with this. And so it, it really drops the, the macroinvertebrate diversity. And then those macroinvertebrates form um, 
food source for, for the fishes. So it can really harm the fishes. It's thought that this one uh, originated in North America, but then was transported around the world and probably on fishing gear um, and by, by trout fishermen. And uh, so a lot of people will come from the United States and Europe and you know, go to New Zealand where they have, uh, you can catch a lot of big trout. Um, and it's worse if you have uh, felt bottom boots because the felt, the diatoms can get in there and the, the people use those because they keep them from slipping on the rocks, but they also harbor organisms that are really tough to get clean. So now there's a lot of programs that if you go into an area to fish, you have to sanitize or bleach all your gear. And you know, we've been sensitive to that. So Anne and I did research in Mongolia and we bleached all the gear that we brought there and then we bleached it before we brought it back um, to, to try to kill and dried after that to try to kill everything. So this is an, this is an interesting one that um, isn't related to, uh, sort of like an algal bloom that's not related to eutrophic conditions, but one that's had pretty widespread effects. Um, Lane would ask a question previously about releasing the salt water to lakes having any effects on the established species. Not much, the Great Lakes are huge, so the salt itself won't have much effect. And also the marine species are pretty unlikely to be able to grow in the, in the fresh water because there's a big shock of going into fresh water from salt water, which we can, we'll talk about a little bit in the, in the future. How much water is released? Um, you know, it can be thousands of gallons. Like, You've seen those big, or at least seen pictures of the big, big freighters, uh, big ocean-going um, cargo ships, and you know if a third of their of their cargo volume is is empty and they're replacing it with water in their bilge tanks, it can it can be a very very large amount of water. All right, so I guess that the take-home message here is you know don't don't dump your aquaria in. Um, and you know, don't dump species in. If you, if you have to get rid of your fishes, you're better off to kill them than to throw, throw them in a place where they're, they're you know, so people think they're, oh, I, I want to keep my fish, you know, it's too bad this fish is going to die. So I'll, I'll release it into the wild, but um, that's not a good thing unless a native species that's already there. Um, get ducks, ducks ate goldfish. Yeah, so yeah, speaking of which, we were just, um, going by the, um, a canal off the Kansas River and saw a koi, uh, which is a carp, but it's a pretty um, high dollar carp, right? Um, so people are people are doing that here as well. It was it was a big one too. I, it must have been there for a while. Okay, we're going to shift gears and talk about extinction rates. Um, we are living in the time of the sixth six great extinctions in the history of Earth. Um, and we're, we'll lose many species. Um, more than half the species will be lost in your lifetimes. Uh, and humans are the cause of that. And between global climate change and habitat destruction, um, invasive species cause extinction of other species. So I, I talked early about the, um, about the chytrid and the movement of the, of the, the frog disease through. Um, aquatic systems are among the most vulnerable systems to extinction. It turns out that the most, they're the most endangered for several reasons. Um, one of them is that people tend to focus on aquatic systems. They tend to build, their populations tend to be near them. Um, also, they tend to overuse the water that goes into them so you can dry them out. That's in Western Kansas, that's a, that's a problem that, that um, broadcast spawning fishes are, are disappearing because they need to, keep their eggs in the, in the water column and, and you have to have terminal flow to do that. And if they drop out and hit a reservoir or if it dries, then they're not able to reproduce. And then you, you're in a, if you're in a watershed, you integrate everything that happens above. So if there's any pollution that happens in the watershed above, you'll receive it downstream. Unlike a terrestrial habitat, that if one spit plot, one plot and has pollution in it that might cause a little problem, it's not necessarily going to transport right next next to it. Um, some of the really extreme examples. Um, so so yeah. So extinction rates are about a million times greater than natural. Extinction does happen naturally, but they're now happening about a million times faster rates. Uh, an example is Lake Victoria, a large shallow lake in, in Africa. 
300 species evolved in 12,000 years. So it's this explosive radiation of, of mostly cichlid fishes. Um, and of those 300, 200 have been extinct over the last decades. And there's two, act, two reasons for that. The, um, one is pollution, and the second is a Nile perch, which um, was in the Nile River, but again, because waterfalls couldn't, couldn't historically get up there. Nile perch has, has been introduced, and it, it, it's a huge fish, a uh, huge predator, and it just eats everything. Um, and and it's, it's a situation that's too bad be, because not only um, does the Nile perch cause the decimation of the, of the fishes, but the people that live around the lake that subsisted on the fishes really can't fish for this, this uh, fish. It's too, too large for them to take with traditional methods. And so there's been a fishery that's developed around the Nile perch, but, but it's worth enough that the, the people, again, around the lake don't have very much money um, and they can't afford to buy the, 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 the protein source. So it's, it's, been a, it's been a real um, real, real disaster for a lot of people living in that area um, and a total disaster for the things that have gone, the species have gone extinct. Um, so in the United States, there's 73 fish, 69 bivalves, 28 snails, 17 amphibians, and 20 crustaceans that are listed as threatened or endangered. And you just see there's not many invertebrates on this list. Um, they're probably not even, they're probably endangered, but people just don't, don't uh, work on them enough so they can't tell if they're gone. Over half the freshwater unionated mussel species are endangered. Um, so most of those are found in North America. And this is a form of, of human impact that's, that's irreversible because, you know, some pollution you can clean up, right? But, um, you know, you can stop lake eutrophication by cleaning up the sources of nutrients. But once an organism's gone, it's gone forever. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Jurassic Park is, is a fantasy. It's not a reality. This is an example of a endangered species, the desert pupfish and Nevada. And this pupfish, um, there's these freshwater springs that come out in the desert. And this is, you can see somebody's leg right there. So this is their entire habitat. And they can go down fairly far in, deep in this, um, maybe 100 meters, but then that's their whole habitat. There's really, really nothing else for them to, to nowhere else for them to go. And all their breeding, you can see a little rock shelf here, right below there. All their breeding happens on that rock shelf. So they, they have to have that particular piece of their habitat. And the picture is here. They're, they're a pretty blue little bluefish. And they're, they were among the first species listed as federally endangered. So there's been a huge effort to, to conserve this species. The, um, one of the efforts is to take them and put them into a constructed habitat nearby. Um, so this is actually a, a, an artificial habitat, and they've they've simulated that bench there, that bench there, in this using spring water coming into this, and then there's a big sort of cave thing down underneath this around the corner that's probably 10, 20 times as large as that, and and. They're able to get the fish to reproduce in here. They'll, they, if they get the eggs, they pull, up, they pull them out and have aquaria and they, they nurture them. They haven't been able to grow the populations very large. For both of these systems, there's a lot of water, well, a lot of money going into, this is a million dollar facility to, to preserve this fish. And you can see there's this, um, this little thing here is there's a series of sensors that go in here. Um, so they're looking at water quality with the sensors in both of these. And we, we looked, we worked with these multi so you, know, you know what those are now. Um, you can do things like conductivity and pH. And then they'll come and census the fish in this every year and report on whether they're having success or not. This, act, this spring is actually protected. There's big razor wire around the whole thing, so people can't go in there anymore and, and, um, and, ca and cause problems. Recently, some... Um, Drunk guys did break in to the, um, into this and they shot out um, the video cameras, but they didn't get them all. So they, they caught them, but they got in there and drank beer and peed in it and all that stuff and, and turned it up. Um, they killed a few fishes uh, just by stomping on them, basically inadvertently. Um, 
but it turned out that it's possible that they actually stimulated things because they right after that happened their reproduction was even higher and i think that nutrient input might have and the, and the disturbance might have allowed the, the fish to reproduce more um so this sets up an interesting example um what, do you think it's worth putting millions and millions of dollars uh to to preserve this one species relative to where those that money could be spent elsewhere preserving other species and um i'll just pause my recording here so yeah there's arguments either ways that there's a lot of money that goes into this and maybe there's um, places where um, you could save more species by reallocating that money uh or um you can argue the other side of things is that it's a completely unique thing. Maybe there's unique genetics here. Maybe there's something that has evolved here that's that's different than anything else, and we and we need to we will lose that uh, forever. Um, you know, and, and question is, do you put it in the zoo, right? Do you put it in this habitat? And if you can keep it going, let this this other habitat go. And the idea is is that to spread the population out a little bit. So if there is a disaster here, or if some jerk comes and dumps a bunch of bleach in there or something. And at least you'll be able to hold the species and maybe reintroduce it. So um, this is the uh, these series of maps from Europe. It's not just North America that has these problems. And um, the green here is the percent of fish, uh, fish species that are threatened. The number of species that are um, that are threatened. Um, percent and the red dots, the big red dots are the ones that have uh, up to 50, 25 to 50 percent. So you can see there's Europe is very heavily impacted in, in Central Europe where, the, where there's a really high population. Spain, uh, Greece and Italy all, all have fairly highly threatened species. And then overlying that is the richness. So you have a lot of rich species richness here, 61 to 71 fish species here lower richness up in the northern areas and we talked about why that might be as well. In B we have the amphibians. Um, again the richness is in dark green and the, the number um, the percent of species is by the size of the size of the circles so the big red circles have you know 25 to 30 percent of the amphibians um, that are endangered. So there's a lot of a high high diversity here and a high proportion of of um, of uh, amphibians that are endangered in, in northern Spain. And then the next panel is the percent of the diversity, fish diversity that's non native species. So we can have up to a third of the fish species being non native, particularly northern Spain through the Pyrenees and southern France um, have a really high proportion of non native species. But there's also some introduced ones down here. Down, um, down here in, in southern and Greece and the islands so south of Greece, and then there's a there's sort of a hot spot over here in in, um, in Western Europe as well. This graph here, the redder is the higher percentage of developed areas, so 75 to 100 percent of the area being developed. You can see agriculture is super intensive. Um, the Alps are a little bit less pressure, but then lots of people, so that's why there's all that pressure here. And then the uh, fragmentation, the dams that, that are set, are keeping this this um, rivers from being connected from upstream. And we can see that there's a a strong effect of, of fragmentation on many of these systems. And then the water stress is related to the drier areas, right? So the highest stress, most severe water stress is in Spain, where there's not much water, and um, and uh, you know Turkey and 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 Greece and southern Italy where it's where it's just drier but also um, there are areas where there's just really like around London and, and Paris where there's just really heavy, heavy use of water that, that's really stressing the, the amount of water. So these things all feed into the idea of this extinction these anthropogenic effects. Um, we have really covered this what's the value of, of freshwater species diversity in the prior discussion and um, we had arguments that you preserving genetics um, intrinsic value of biodiversity uh, ecosystem function lane mentioned is it asked if it was important to, the pupfish was important to, to um, ecosystem function so i think we hit we hit we hit a lot a lot of those um, you can actually put a value on it in the sense that 
because of the Endangered Species Act in the, in the United States, we're required to protect species and the people then will, people have to put in um, plans to protect them and, and how much it's gonna cost to protect them. So that's sort of what, what the value is as well, like uh, what you're assessed for, for getting rid of it. But you have to ask yourself if somebody wants to, you know, build a Walmart parking lot um, and they're gonna cause extinction of the species, is, is it okay for them to just say, yeah, here's here's a thousand dollars or a hundred million dollars. Is it okay for them to say, here, I'll give you this money and let us let us wipe the species out, right? So this is not necessarily an economic question in a lot of ways. A lot of it's more of a of a moral question, whether whether we think that species have a an intrinsic right to exist, as Cassie mentioned, intrinsic value, whether they have an intrinsic right to exist, it's a side of humans 